Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining. We're just going to wait uh, probably half more minute and then uh, we'll get started. Just waiting for everyone to join the call. Great, we've got uh, just shy of 150 people on so far. Uh, we've had over 300 registrants for today. So um, I will get started just in the interest of time. So everyone, welcome and thank you very much for joining today's forum, Confronting Racial Inequality and Driving Systemic Change as an Industry. Before we jump in, just want to go through some housekeeping, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. First of all, I really want to thank all of our foundational partners. Without our partners, we honestly would not be able to host these events or um, deliver these initiatives to you. So a massive uh, shout out and thank you to all of our generous foundational partners. And as many of you uh, should know, we obviously send out a post event survey which goes out after the forum. It's really important that we get your feedback on the forum. Um, it really helps us shape future forums and make sure that we're always delivering as, as great value as we can to you. Um, so that we can bring thought leadership and you in turn can do the best job, whether it's from an agency brand or property perspective. So I'd really appreciate, or we would really appreciate it if you could take the two minutes out of your time after today's forum just to uh, provide us with feedback. And board nominations and volunteer applications. So we're excited that recruitment for the 2020-2021 roster of volunteers is currently underway. We're inviting applications for four positions on the board of directors, as well as applications for our various committees, which are the Education Committee, the Business Development Committee, Marketing Committee, and of course, the Sponsorship Marketing Awards Committee. So please do head to the SMCC website to submit an application and by Friday, the August 21st, which is the deadline, if you're interested um, in taking part or joining. Highlighting obviously that volunteering with SMCC is a great way to make connections in the industry and obviously to develop new skills as well. Just want to highlight that if you are volunteering on one of our committee committees or if you are one of our board directors, that is um, that is solely available for um, people who are current members of SMCC. So if you're not yet a member, member but you are interested, please also make sure that you do sign up and register as a member by August 21st. And before jumping into this forum, just want to give you a heads up on our forthcoming forum next month. It's going to be a really, really interesting one. We have three amazing speakers lined up. We'll be um, bringing more information to, um, to you shortly on this, but the topic will focus on the future of live events um, as a result of COVID. So yes, save the date and make sure you uh, stay tuned for more details on that. And then Obviously, critically important, and I'm sure is in everyone's calendar on a yearly basis, is our summer social. So obviously, we've had to pivot this year with COVID and how we're doing things virtually. So we'll be raising a glass next month. The date will be confirmed shortly so that we can all stay in touch, support one another, and obviously connect virtually as well. So the last beers and cheers that we had was a great success for any of you that were on it. And we're sure that this one will be equally so as well. We'll have more information on that coming shortly. And then just want to jump into some very quick Zoom webinar um, housekeeping issues. Um, for those of you who are new to Zoom, some features that we all just want to make you aware of. You're all going to be muted and unable to turn your video on. And the reason for that is just to make sure there's no background noise or distractions. But if you are having any issues with your audio, please check your audio settings, which can be accessed in the control bar. Any other issues, just let us know through the Q&A function and the team at Redstone, who are obviously always amazing, will um, help you get sorted out. And then lastly, highlighting that this webinar, as well as the other webinars that we've hosted to date, will be posted on YouTube for you to watch. So if you miss any of this, hopefully you won't, but if you do, or if you've missed any of our previous forums, we'd really encourage you to go on YouTube to check them out. Before jumping in to this month's um, model, um, Market Watch, as well as panel, I'd like to first introduce Jana Masowicz, who, as many of, you, as many of you know, is the RSMCC Chair, as well as the VP at Sponsorship and Events at Publicist Sport and Entertainment. Jana's going to be sharing 
uh, an exciting announcement and insight on SMCC's commitment to creating a more inclusive community that is representative of diverse voices and perspectives. Jenna, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Sean, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the SMCC Board of Directors, I hope you, your teams, um, your organizations, your families have been keeping safe and healthy during this uh, truly transformative year. At the SMCC, we've been working diligently um, as a collective across the board, committee chairs, and our incredible depth of committee volunteers to adapt our programming to continue to bring you valuable thought leadership um, and connect with one another during this time of extraordinary change. The Sponsorship Marketing Awards, the SMAs, as you know them, were launched in 2000 to recognize sponsorship marketing excellence and have become really an anticipated event on the Canadian marketing calendar. The SMAs recognize the exceptional work of properties, brands, and agencies that have maximized return on their investments and inspire all of us to do the same. While we had to postpone the 20th annual SMAs that were originally set to take place April the 2nd at the Royal Conservatory, I am truly excited to announce we will be hosting the SMAs through a new unique virtual format on September 24th, 2020. Um, although we can't celebrate together in person as we would like to, the virtual awards will really be an incredible evening of learning networking and celebrating Canada's top sponsorship marketing programs of 2019. Um, it will be a different format than the Zoom webinar format that you've become accustomed to for these webinars. We will have more details on that soon uh, and registration will be launching as well. So keep an eye on your email um, as well as your social channels for more information on that. <clears throat> now, a little bit more um, about why we're all here today. Certainly the death of George Floyd and the growing global Black Lives Matter movement has caused many of us individually um, and across our organizations, including the board here at the SNCC, to reflect on how we can improve racial equality by addressing bias and behaviors, becoming active allies, addressing barriers to entry and advancement, and thinking about how we all show up for our fans, customers, and Canadians in our work as an industry. SNCC is committed to building uh, a long-term sustained approach to actively combat racism and promote diversity in our industry at all levels. SMCC is currently taking the following steps and actions towards building a more equal, inclusive, and diverse community. The first is forming and investing in an SMCC Diversity and Inclusion Committee. The chair of the committee will be selected once the 2020-2021 Board of Directors is ratified at the AGM this fall. If you're interested in this role, please apply for one of the four available Board of Director positions and state your interest on your application. As Sean mentioned, uh, the application process is currently open on our website right now. The second is to look at leveraging our existing as well as building new SMCC partnerships and programs to attract a more diverse talent pool to the industry. We have a number of programs currently at our disposal that we will look to leverage, um, as well as uh, investigating and exploring new programs to expand um, our offering and again, uh, diversify um, our talent and our community. The third is promoting diverse voices through our events and content, and I'm so thrilled that we have such an incredible group of speakers here today to share their insights. The fourth, um, and which is certainly not the final piece, but um, is the last uh, that we'll mention for right now, is reviewing the SMCC electoral and volunteer outreach process to create a diverse and inclusive community at all levels of government. We know that change will take continued daily effort and time. These are really only first steps with many more to come, including holding today's webinar, where we're so thrilled to have such an incredible group of passionate thought leaders driving change in their own organizations to share insights on this important issue. I know I'm personally looking forward to listening and learning over the next hour, including hearing from our Market Watch presenter today partner and co-founder of Ethnicity Multicultural Marketing and Advertising, Howard Lichtman. Howard, thank you so much for being here and over to you. 
My pleasure, quite a task. We're going to move to the first slide of the presentation, which is basically a roundup of market news related to this topic. And it's definitely been in the news, and I'm going to focus on racialized brands. So if we move to the next slide, I'm going to basically talk about unconscious bias. Because racialized brands all begin with unconscious bias. And I'm going to show you an edited version of this woman's video, which really speaks to unconscious bias. So look at that woman and be honest with yourself. No one's going to be reading into your minds. What comes to mind when you see her? What does she do for a living? What kind of person is she? Um, here's a, an edited version. Find out a little bit more. Here we go. Someone who looks like me walks past you in the street. Do you think they're a mother, a refugee, or a victim of oppression? Or do you think they're a cardiologist, a barrister, or maybe your local politician? Do you look me up and down, wondering how hot I must get, or if my husband has forced me to wear this outfit? What if I wore my scarf like this? We are freezing. SMCC, how are we doing in terms of unfreezing? Are we going to continue or are we going to move on? What are we doing? Just going to chime in it, Sean. Howard, I think what we can do is we can share, I know this video is obviously really critical to um, yep. Market Watch, but we can share it as part of the resource list. Yeah, the let's, okay. To the audience. So let's continue with the, your slides if we can. Okay, yeah. Um, so I strongly recommend, if we can pull up the slides, I strongly recommend you watch the video. Uh, it's actually an edited version that I was showing you. Um, it, it turns out that this woman is everything from, she was on the race car team in university. She spent five years as a boxer. And as she basically takes off her garb, you discover that she's a senior leader, uh, engineer, uh, on a you know fighter boat. Is that what you thought of her when you first saw her? So that's what unconscious is, bias is all uh, is all about. Is what do we think about people when we first uh, see them? So I, I strongly recommend you see that particular video. It's very very powerful. So let's move into the to the role of sponsors and and the the uh, before we get into sponsorship of we're going to talk about you know racialized brands and they've been in the news. The first one I want to point to is on the next slide. And uh, when I when we look at some of these images, these are the brands that have been in the news. And if we look at a sort of like. Uh, Webster's Dictionary definition of what a racialized brand is, it's basically ascribing an ethnic or racial identity to a brand that doesn't really identify itself as such. So it's not, they're not really an, an ethnic or racial brand. But even more importantly, it's perpetuating a negative stereotype. And these brands have been under attack over the past couple of weeks. The first brand, and, and there's lots more that I'm going to talk about today, is on the next slide which is Uncle Ben's rice. Don't know about you, but I grow up eating Uncle Ben's uh, rice. Um, the history of the name, like what, so what's wrong with Uncle Ben's rice? Why is that a racialized brand? Because Uncle Ben's name actually came from a black Texan rice farmer, and the image was a black Chicago chef and waiter, Frank Brown. So nothing terrible about that, but it's Uncle Ben. And the term uncle and aunt were used by white Southerners as honorifics. And honorifics is what do you call somebody to honor them? So we say Mr., we say Mrs. So they basically didn't want to honor a black person with calling them a Mr. or Mrs., so they were called uncle or aunt. So even the term Uncle Ben is a racialization of the brand. What happened due to Black Lives Matter and, and uh, all of the media, what was going on, June 17th, they announced a change of their brand identity. So this was Mars, and Mars actually did this. They weren't the first. Pepsi was the first. More on Pepsi later. Second example of stuff we grew up with 
and taking action now after Uncle Ben's rice is on the next slide, which is cream of wheat. These are classical uh, brands. So the cream of wheat character, most people don't know, but it was a black chef known as Rastus. And that was a former slave who spoke broken English. So Rastus carries a very pejorative sort of connotation for African Americans because it's really all about, you know, hey, they don't even speak English well. Again, they announced a change uh, coming to their packaging, right? Inspired by, again, what's happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement. Next example from our pantries and from our youth is Eskimo pies. I grew up loving Eskimo pies, haven't had one in a long time, but the term Eskimo is commonly used to refer to native people in the Arctic region. It's considered derogatory because it's a term given by non-Inuit people, and it was said to mean eaters of raw meat. When people were talking about eaters of raw meat, they were basically saying that these people were barbarians. June 17th, they said, we're going to change our name because we're committed to being part of the solution on racial equality and recognizing the term is derogatory. I want you to think about this and contrast it, and the reason why I picked it, to our own uh, Edmonton Eskimos and their reaction. Moving right on. I'm going to end in terms of the brand examples with Anne Jemima, because Anne Jemima is a 131-year-old brand that uh, was started by Quaker Oats, now owned by Pepsi. And they basically acknowledged that Anne Jemima's origins were based on a racial stereotype of a friendly black woman working as a servant, as a slave or a nanny to a white family. And it appeared on TikTok, there was a viral TikTok that came out uh, talking about the origins of the brand, and PepsiCo immediately, immediately reflected on this, and they did something. And they were really the first brand to take action. And if we turn to the next page, which I believe is even more important, because the other brands and there are other examples of people taking action now, uh, they realized that changing the name and image is only one piece of the puzzle. They made a commitment beyond changing the name and the brand to invest $400 million over five years into black communities and to increase black representation at PepsiCo. And, it, and it's a long list, but basically they made a, a commitment to have black managerial roles and they set targets, 30% more by 2025. They changing their recruitment policies, their scholarship programs, their mentoring programs. They're doubling the spending on black suppliers. They're giving $50 million to black businesses. They're making community investments. They're including black voices in the marketing content creative for everybody who's in the creative side of the agency businesses. That's going to be important to the PepsiCo family. And they're doing training on what, what the video that we couldn't show on unconscious bias and what that is all about. So the puzzle is not just about changing a name or a brand in response to a situation. It's taking actual action as to what we're going to do, like Jana was talking about before. Next slide. Moving on to uh, racialized sports teams, uh, closer to home from a sponsorship perspective. So the Washington Redskins, we, we've all grown up with them, right? Now, Redskins is a term used by bounty hunters to identify indigenous people by the color of their skin. And they were called bounty hunters because their job was to murder these Native, Native Americans. So think of the history of that brand and that image. On July 3rd, they said, we're going to conduct a thorough review of their 87-year-old name. By July 13th, 10 days later, this is how the world is changing in terms of Market Watch. They announced the change of the team name and the logo. Why? It was about sponsorship. Nike, FedEx, PepsiCo, Bank of America said, if you don't make a change, we're pulling our dollars. So this is the value of sponsorship dollars for doing good in, in a way that we've never really experienced um, before. FedEx made a statement and basically said, change your name or, you know, that $45 million in contract fees that uh, we promised you, we're not paying them. Come sue us. Nike refused their merchandise from the stores, as did Amazon, Walmart, Target, and Dick's Sporting Goods. Next example in the sports world. Cleveland Indians. The Cleveland Indians were originally called the Cleveland Naps, and they changed their name to Indians to honor a Native American player. 
Louis Soklekis. In 2019, they said, okay, we're going to remove the uh, Chinese Wahoo logo from our uniform caps because they were facing uh, public backlash, but they weren't changing their name. July 3rd, they said, you know what? We think we may, we may have to take a look at this. We're going to get back to you. They haven't made a change yet to determine the best pass forward with their 105-year-old name. These are not like new brands. They've been around for a long time. Now, why are they now reconsidering? Again, the power of sponsorship. It's the fear of losing their major partner, Progressive Insurance. Progressive Insurance paid naming rights for the field, and they're basically saying, you know what? We're going to pull our naming rights. We don't want to be associated with the team that is doing this. They're taking action with their wallets. Next slide, Chicago Blackhawks. Historic uh, Blackhawk figure a, a sack and, of the Sac and Fox Nation. Now, in the past, they've donated money to Indigenous people to raise awareness of the Blackhawks' history, and they announced they're not going to make a change. They said they're committed to raising the bar even higher to expand the awareness of the Blackhawk and the important contributions of Native American people. Can't tell you whether that will ever change. Uh, right now, there's no sponsorship pressure, and in most of the other situations, it was sponsorship pressure that resulted in, in the uh, change. They are facing pressure from tribal groups and social justice advocates. Next brand, Atlanta Braves. Braves comes from the term for Native American warriors, and they use foam tomahawks. And they, this was criticized by Navis Amer Native groups as being demeaning to them. So they announced they're not changing their name. They said they're committed to Native Americans that have been in discussions with tribes for how best to support them. But they are going to review their tomahawk chop. So just think about racialization of brands. Think about unconscious bias. They are basically looking at the tomahawk chop because of public pressure and statements and the Black Lives Matter, but at the end of the day, uh, no sponsorship pressure. Edmonton Eskimos, our own. I mentioned that it's all about being eaters of raw meat. July 14th, they were defending their position, and they saying it invokes toughness, hardness, and the ability to perform in cold weather. July 17th, they finally announced a decision to change their name, largely due to Bel Air Direct and Sports Interaction, giving them an ultimatum, change your name, or we're gonna pull our sponsorship. Vancouver Canucks is the opposite side. So when I say it's about action, it's not just about changing racialized brands, it's also about outreach. And these are some quick examples. We've done some work with the Canucks in some of these events. They've got a Diwali night where it's dedicated to the community. So it's the reverse, they're welcoming, where they've got live entertainment and South Asian food and dancing. They have a Lunar New Year jersey. Moving on to the next example. The CFL, as, as an organization, as opposed to an individual team, they launched the program uh, at Diversity is Strength in 2018 with limited edition t-shirts and activities about diversity. And week 10 and 11 across the country, they've got all kinds of activities. We've done some ethnic research for them. So we know the CFL is committed to doing things right. And then the Raptors. So we think of the Raptors, we go, yeah, they're symbolic of Canada. They're actually Canada's team. And, and look, at the ethnic, look at the ethnic audiences. But the point about the Raptors is it didn't begin today, and it began with actions. It, it began really 25 years ago in 1995, and we've seen them held ethnic nights. We, we've seen Drake become their ambassador. We see the halftime presentations that are dedicated to ethnic outreach. We see DJs, the Raptors superfan, Jerry Lynn. So just look at the picture on the left at Nav Batya, and we all know him as a super fan today. It isn't it great that we've got a South Asian that's our super fan. It began 25 years ago. So the, the, the commitments and action uh, really is not something you can do in terms of just change, changing a name. Like Jana says, it takes time, but it's the actions that are important. Next slide, please. Commitment to systematic change, which Anna was also talking about. If we take a look at the uh, next slide, this is a New York Times ad. It also appeared in USA Today, and it's by an organization that we're part of called AIM, which is the multicultural arm of uh, the uh, ANA. We're a signatory to this. And if you go to the next slide, it talks about what organizations can do about change. And it's called We Hear You, We Are With You. So the commitment here is to achieve representation that reflects the country's demographics to conduct conversations about systemic inequalities, 
to eliminate bias through accurate portrayal of race, identity, and culture in our advertising and media programs, to increase spending in multicultural marketing to be reflective of the size of the population. So in the States, they're saying we spend 5% on multicultural. Um, it's not enough because it should be much higher. In Canada, it theoretically, proportionally, it would be 20%. They've made a commitment to the accuracy of multicultural and inclusive data, equitable creative supply chain that's talent again like Pepsi, and they're double downing on cross-country partnerships to support diverse suppliers. I'm going to end off here with a sponsored ad which we can begin from Carlsberg. And while you didn't see the unconscious bias in the beginning, think about unconscious bias as you watch this video. So while it's not about race, it is about unconscious bias. So we have to make sure that as individuals, we fight unconscious bias. As, as brands, we make sure we're not racialized, that we actually take action both as organizations like the SMCC uh, and as individuals in terms of our sponsorship dollars. And with that, I will uh, mute and pass it on to the next speaker. Amazing. Thank you so much, Howard, for the uh, comprehensive audit of what um, brands and properties are doing in terms of change. Uh, apologies everyone to the issue with the first video, but as mentioned, that will be in the resource list that we send out. So please do have a look at it. I'd like, now to, I'd like to now introduce Kayla Gray, our moderator. Uh, Kayla is an award-winning journalist who is currently an anchor for Sports Center on Canada's leading sports network, TSN. And in addition to that, Kayla is also a weekly sports correspondent for CTV's Your Morning, and she has made numerous appearances on sh so shows such as The Social, the Marilyn Dennis Show, CP24, and eTalk. In 2017, she was named CBC's list of 150 black women making history in Canada and CIBWE's list of 100 women to watch. And when she made her debut on Sports Center in 2018, Kayla became the first black woman to ever host a flagship sports highlight show in Canada. Last year in 2019, Kayla won the black, BuyBlacks.com People's Choice Award for TV Personality of the Year. And if you don't know her, any of those achievements, I'm sure you'd recognize her as part of the work that she's doing with the Raptors. Kayla, over to you for today's panel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully everyone can see me. Hi, how's it going? Thank you guys so much for taking the time out um, to really engage and listen to this important conversation. Now, I'm not going to be the only one that's speaking. In fact, we have three panelists who are incredible and can give us incredible insight as we are trying to build conversations to move forward in the conversation around, frankly, just making our spaces better, more inclusive, and that just being at the goal. And I want that to be the baseline. We should all be striving for excellence. And when we talk about excellence in our companies and our action plans and what we are about, automatically diversity is a part of that. Um, so without further ado, I wanna 
introduce the three panelists with us. First, we'll start off um, with Mark Harrison, who just popped up there, president and CEO of the T1 Agency. Mark is a big believer of purpose, branding purpose, people walking, talking, moving, doing everything with purpose. And that is what led him to create the T1 Agency 26 years ago. Um, he is a member of the OUA Black Lives Matter Task Force and campaign cabinet member at the Cam H Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Thanks for having me. Okay, next up, let's see who pops up. Uh, let's go with Nadine Spencer. Um, she is CEO of Brandy Cube Group Inc., which is a global uh, agency specializing in social change, marketing, comms, and PR. She has accelerated strategic growth and brand visibility for a diverse client portfolio. She is also president of the Black Business and Professional Association. Nadine, thank you so much for joining us. All right, next up. Guys, if I call him Jermaine at any point during this, please forgive me, I work with his brother. Uh, <laughs> Julian Franklin, president of Franklin Management Group, which is a strategic marketing activation and sponsorship consultancy. Julian has 20 plus years of client and agency experience in consumer packaged goods and sport industries. He worked with the Jays, Kraft Heinz, also developing award-winning programs like the Kraft Hockeyville. He's also a founding member of the People of Color in Advertising and Marketing um, Association that advocates the inclusion and advancement of BIPOC within marketing. So all three of you guys, thank you so much um, for joining us all here today. Now I look across my screen and you know, all three of you rightfully so are in great powerful positions, but we are all people of color, we are all black. Um, and so that means with that position and with that power, too often we are the onlys in certain rooms and in certain atmospheres. So Nadine, I'll start off with you because you come from a very inter interesting perspective of this and trying to, your mission has been to change the rooms, the boardrooms, really trying to open up seats for other people of color to, to grab a seat and also have their say. Uh, what has your experience been? I think we are just waiting for audio. So while Nadine's getting audio, Julian, maybe we can speak to it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Kayla, thanks so much for the introduction, and I'm uh, pleased to be with everybody here on uh, online. And thanks for the SMCC for uh, putting this this on. I would say, you know, when it comes to being the only, you know, the experience uh, is one where it's taken. Um, a, a pretty much as the the structure of my entire career, it's been something where you know, when I step into a room, uh, there is, you know, the obvious that whether I'm in a leadership position that I am now or where, whether I was coming up that I was really the only individual that, you know, quite frankly, looked like me uh, in the room. It was something that, um, you know, quite honestly, and even today, as you speak to uh, a lot of people who are coming up the ranks, it's something that, that can be draining, can sometimes be demoralizing, mm -hmm. but also it's something that, you know, it, it has, I've used it as fuel because it's been fuel that has helped me, you know, project myself and also to um you know get to where i needed to go without my within my career and i think that you know when you see individuals such as mark and nadine and yourself and myself and others you know we are not the onlys there's so many of us out there um that quite frankly in corporate canada and sponsorship canada that um need to be shown need to be elevated because we are doing the work uh, we have the capacity to do the work and the skill set and it's something that uh, quite honestly um you know, to the point of unconscious bias, sometimes consciously um, leaders are not letting uh, us through the door. And I think that that is mm -hmm. something that uh, needs to be addressed. So we have Nadine's audio back, but I do want to pick up on what you said on us not being the only, because I'm not sure if you guys are noticing this or hearing this in conversations that you're having with people that are not black is they're saying, we just can't simply find people. They're not out there, they're not applying. And frankly, it's a lazy way of thinking because as you said, there are people out there. It's just, how do we bring them into the room? So Nadine, let's bring you back because you are responsible for that. That is kind of your brand's mission statement. Uh, what are you noticing in terms of that barrier to get black people in the building? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if we can't find them, we're not looking. You, if we can't find them, it's because we don't want to find them. And, and one of the reasons why I say read the room is many times I've been the only, the only woman of color in many, many spaces. And I think to myself, if we look, if we look around that room and we see one individual, we need to sort of, we need to include more. 
We need to include more. I, I've done many talks with different organizations, and I won't call anybody out, I promise. But when we, when we say we have a diversity policy, diversity and inclusion policy, and we look at the head of that organization, and we look at the board, and we do not see any diversity there or any even equity in many times or any representation, we, we truly cannot say we have an inclusive policy. You know, so when I say read the room, I, I ask all, all government and, and corporations and public sector, public and private, to, to look at your environment around you. Read the room. Look, look at the people and see who's missing. And, and then start making the changes to have that inclusive um, sector that we talk about. And so we just have to see. In law, they say, right, the thing speaks for itself. And if we're not seeing our society represented in our organizations, then we know that we're not doing a good job. So, Mark, we'll then bring you in because president and CEO, you know, we've talked offline, all of us, about kind of some of the self-reflections that you've been doing. Where right. does a president and CEO start? Oh, I'll give you a quick backstory. A couple of years ago, I was at a very fancy Canadian Olympic Committee fundraising banquet in the elevator afterwards with the CEO, one of my clients in the Minister of Sport. I saw a couple looking at me and whispering. Before the elevator hit the ground floor, the woman handed the man her coat check ticket and he handed it to me and, whisked and said, could you get our coats first? This is less than five, 10 years ago. And I would say for me personally, that didn't really bother me because I've always been, um, purposeful about my life. But George Floyd bothered me. It more than bothered me. It, it still gives me nightmares. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember hearing about Emmett Till. We saw Rodney King, Dr. King, etc. And for me, what was really clear after George Floyd was I hadn't done enough in my own organization. I own a company that has 75 amazing teammates. I'm the only black person here. I haven't done enough for my industry and I haven't done enough for uh, to recognize uh, that people need help. And I would be one of those people that say, literally, I've not been purposeful in how do I help more young black Canadians get elevated in our business. I just want to quickly also thank Jana and the SMCC for their opening statement because I, that's incredibly powerful and it's needed. So yeah. it's off to the SMCC. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we all have those stories. I think I had told you guys that even after I'm done sports center, all done up makeup, I still drive because I'm finished my shows at two in the morning and I make sure I wear my work pass around my neck just in case I get stopped by the police. Um, you know, I have a two year old, he's a son, he's a black boy. And at some point he's gonna be a black man. Um, and so I have to prepare myself for the certain conversations um, that frankly, just have to happen when you're raising black children. And it is terrifying. So I think the reason why I go so hard is, is, you know, is I see in real life what that looks like. And I almost feel like if there's more representation at tables, um, then we'll become more human to more people. And it, you shouldn't have to validate your humanity. And I think that that's where we're at. But you bring up George Floyd eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I don't know how anyone walks past that or doesn't still think about that because I think that coupled with the stillness of the world right now, it's when a lot of eyes were opened. Um, and it was when we were seeing a lot of PR statements. So Julian, I ask you, why are PR statements not enough? PR statements are not enough because it's the easy way out to be blunt. Um, you know, crafting uh, a well-read, well-written PR statement, you know, for a lot of these companies is like basically waking up and falling out of bed. Um, it's table stakes. It's something that, thank you for writing it, but then if there's no meat on the bone following up, it's just, it's just empty words. And so, you know, when we see organizations scramble, to be honest, after, um, you know, the human outcry of uh, George Floyd, and uh, we also cannot forget others such as Breonna Taylor uh, at this time, where it just quite frankly, it was murder, is murder, and is something that needs uh, to be addressed through the appropriate court systems. When we can't turn a blind eye to what's happening here on our home soil, um, we've unfortunately seen since George Floyd's passing, you know, uh, police brutality, not only on uh, black, but also indigenous individuals, and um, there's a reckoning. And you know what's happening is people are telling companies, you know, 
thank you for the piece of paper and the words on it, but you're going to have to do more and you're going to have to do more through uh, funding, uh, you know, uh, events and, you know, um, initiatives that support uh, BIPOC individuals, not only in your office, but also bringing people in. And, you know, quite frankly, you're going to have to move over and share space. And I think that that's something that is going to be very crucial in the long term, the sharing of space uh, by leaders uh, who are non-white. Um, sorry, by leaders who are white to say, you know, this, this room is meant for you, not just one or two of you, but m many of you so we can get some real uh, change done. And I think that's yeah. very important that you bring that up, Nadine, and maybe you'll touch on this is I think one of the biggest reasons why a lot of us are hesitant in having these conversations it, is it requires a lot of our white counterparts or white um, people that we work with to ask themselves, what are you willing to give up? because some of the reasons why we haven't seen change as fast as people are asking themselves, and it's frank, listen, these conversations are going to get uncomfortable, so we might as well have them, um, is what does that mean for me and my position and my promotion and my job? And so, you know, when you have that at the base, Nadine, how does that help change a response, a reaction and an actual response within companies? Yeah, I mean, I think companies have to be intentional, very, very intentional about change. If, if, and, and what I would like to see is not to just talk, you know, move to action. I don't, I don't want people to tell us. So, you know, at, at the BBPA, we get a lot of calls from companies who want to um, participate in, in what, what's next. How can we help? Well, you know how, how we can help? As, as, as Julian says, make space. If you're in a retail environment, dedicate some space to Black-owned businesses. You know, be very intentional about the work that we're going to do. Be intentional about training. Be intentional about the investment. And be truly, truly intentional about equity. Um, because in inclusivity, as I mentioned, you know, when you're in a space, we want to have equality always represented. And yes, yeah, you're going to have some skin in the game, and the, the skin in the game is, is going to be real action, and um, it might hurt a little bit just in terms of what you're giving up. But if we, I, I, we, we cannot imagine that we're going to continue in a society that is not just for everybody. And, and at the other end of the pendulum, um, access and privilege is, is, has been given because of, of, of lack of of, of other people. Like as Denim Jolly, our founder of the BBPA says, you know, if you have people working for you and you're not paying them and how many years we've been working and not being paid and in today's day, we haven't, we're not having equal pay, then obviously you're going to be ahead. So yeah. we, we need to look at and, and adjust the scales immediately to, to have equity. You know, one of the things in my research and because I do believe a lot of the real work is the behind the scenes stuff um, is what can pump companies publicly do right now? We talked about PR statements, of course, um, but I do think that there also needs to be some public aspect of that. And I mean, action plan, what are companies going to do? But another thing that's a little bit tricky and Mark, maybe you could speak to this is publishing where you're at right now. Um, numbers, who mm -hmm. is in your C-suite? How many black people working in black or indigenous voices are actually in the building? And of course it's met with through the research of the questions I've been asking is kind of pushback from the HR department, of course, because some people, and I'll admit, I was that black employee who never checked the box because I was afraid of what that might mean for me in the future. Um, but Mark, maybe you can shed some light on why we may maybe need to bring back racial surveys so that we can have these numbers to set goals for our future. The Black North Initiative on Monday during their summit uh, in the Education Committee breakout, they showed some numbers that the average Black Canadian for the same job makes ten to twelve thousand dollars less a year than the average White Canadian. Mm. How many people realize that? I didn't realize that. Um, we published our numbers as I mentioned before, and, and my. Some of my teammates confronted me and said, how come you're the only black person here? And, you know, I'm not trying to suggest I'm a, a born again or, or whatever. So the the issue is right here. And I think that um, it's very interesting your comment about not checking the box, because I'm sure all three of you feel like we're the most popular people on the face of the earth. Right now. We're getting cold calls to join boards, be part of it. Like, thank you very much. I didn't know it was so important. Um, so what I'm trying to do personally is we've, we've launched 
a diversity and inclusivity committee here, which we did not have before. We have looked at um, our interns, for example. I'm very focused um, uh, on the entry level, on bringing people in. We had a we have quite frankly, we seventy percent of our interns are from one race, one gender, and one university, and they're they've all been great. But the point is, we haven't been purposeful. And so uh, Julian and others have joined me in a very volunteer group. We're just trying to create more pipeline and recognize that. There's a lot of black Canadians that come from socioeconomic situations. They can't take that unpaid internship or that yeah. minimum wage internship because they might not have the family support. So we have to solve these things and we have to publish our numbers. And back to Julian's comments about press releases, I'd love for some of them to say, we're actually going to uh, provide anti-racist training. And I'm not saying um, that I'm not somebody who else should take, we all should take it. Yeah. Numbers, quotas, stats, we're investing, we're buying, like, let's start with racism. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd seen Howard's video because I know, I want to know what the end is because I know what we all assumed. Right. And, you know, Nadine and Julian, you can both speak to this because sometimes the way we can appeal to people is through dollars. And frankly, um, the Black and Indigenous dollar has been isolated and pushed to the side. So why is it incredibly important for our industries to make sure that they are creating an inclusive space also to the people that they market to, to the people that are in their space? Because frankly, if the bottom dollar is what everybody cares about, a lot of companies are missing a big bag. Yeah, I would, I would agree 100%. I think that, you know, it goes back to just how, you know, the system and how we're conditioned just to um, believe that a core consumer is, you know, uh, a white male or white female, you know, 18 to 45, uh, you know, household income of $90,000 plus, lives in a certain household, uh, has 2.2 kids, we want their money. And it's like, that is not Canada. Uh, that right. is just a slice of the Canadian pie. Um, you know, there's, there's black, there's indigenous, there's people of color, there's uh, immigrants who've come to this country who are doing amazing things, and we should be targeting them across the board you know, specific to our own industry, we know that, you know, the industry that we work in, you know, for the most part, from a sports perspective, is a cultural mosaic. We know that there's majority of the players in some of these sports are black or, or dark skin. We also know within the arts and entertainment industry, that's a cultural mosaic as well. It's not a monolith. It's not uh, completely white. And we, we have to look and ask ourselves, you know, if we are trying to market and sell uh, to uh, corporate Canada, you know, what this entity of sponsorship or what these properties are, you know, we should look more like Canada, um, you know, in, in the, in the offices when we're selling. So I think it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a, it's a great discussion to have. It's a deep one. Um, but, you know, I think we should also be very objective and looking at the, the stats and the facts and, you know, how do we turn those things around back to Mark's point? Um, maybe it, uh, it is the need for some kind of quota or being intentional on how we're doing our practices moving forward. Right. And I think for sure it's setting, it's letting us know where you're at because I'm a true believer of we cannot fix what we do not see. So right. I don't want to see people five months from now being like, oh guys, look all of the things that we did. Well, where did you start? So I can really measure what that change looks like. So it does have, make your numbers public, make your goals public so we can hold you accountable in the public eye as well. Um, but it's very important when we're talking about these issues, I think one of the questions that had come up from one of the registrants was cancel culture. Um, and so we're talking about this reckoning that's going on here. And you know, this conversation of cancel culture while people are just literally asking you to open the pool or to value life or to strive for equality has kind of conveniently come up at the same time. Um, do you guys believe in cancel culture or do you just think that this is just a time for people to just be accountable? Well, I'll jump in. I think that um, hard for me to answer. I don't, I don't personally believe in, in the ubiquity of cancel culture, but I do believe in um, learning. So I will admit I'm a massive football fan. At the onset, I thought Redskins mm. were bad, Eskimos not, until I read right so for me i think it's, it's great these changes are being made i think it's let's be realistic it's about the money 
Daniel Snyder did not wake up and become a good person. Read the stories about him making a male executive do cartwheels in the office because he used to be a university cheerleader and when he didn't like his presentation. So cancel culture, I understand. But, you know, we also have to be realistic and dig in and understand that at a time, slavery, unfortunately, was legal. That doesn't mean we should leave slavers up and their monuments, but we should also look holistically like, what is that going to change? Right. Candidly, I'm much more concerned about tomorrow. I'm much more concerned about this lasting for five years. And I'm much more concerned about the world we're going to leave behind for our children, whether it be your two-year-old or my 17, 19-year-olds. And I think that's also legacy. And part of that, I mean, for me is how do we bring people in? Um, for my specific job, it's editorially. How do we tell the stories of marginalized people? But I think the strongest component is workplace safety and environment. When we're bringing people of color, because what we're going to see is a lot of people of color being hired, right? Which is great. It's a start. But then we got to talk about workplace culture. So Nadine, how does one really do the real root work in creating an environment that feels safe for people to actually work in that are, were not welcome to be there in the first place? You know, and, and again, I, you know, I, I, I go to that in inclusiveness. You know, I, I remember working at an, at a, organization and they had, um, you know, don't bring ethnic foods to work because it smells when you warm it up in the microwave. No Italian. And, and, and I, and I thought as I warm, I wanted to warm up my curry goat, you know, <laughs> but, but I, I just think to myself, if, if we are really going to be inclusive and, it, and, and increase it in our talent pool, um, a diverse work team, how, how then do we make sure that we are truly inclusive. What, what is the language? What is the language that we're using with, 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 with our um, diverse teams? What is the corporate culture? You know, are we saying we're going to drink uh, after six? Because we have to respect that some individuals are not, they, they're not having alcohol. They're not drinking after six. What, what, what is the conversation around LGBTQ? How are we truly setting a tone, a culture of openness, in, in, our, in, in, our, in our company? And also, how are we you know, mentoring um, individuals that, that may not feel comfortable? What is the, that environment? So it's one thing to say, yes, we're going to now hire differently, but what is the tone we're setting within the corporate culture, within the organizations that independents can stay, thrive, and feel like we, we truly belong? I mean, Julian, you are a huge part of an open letter that was sending out, sent out to a marketing and advertising leaders um, in the industry. And to Nadine's point, it's about having real conversations. And perhaps one of the biggest roadblocks is the, the comfort. You know, some people have been comfortable in how things have been going for a long, long time. You bring up Dan Snyder, he's been comfortable with the culture that he's created. Um, so when it comes to now tackling a, a topic that can be quote unquote uncomfortable, and I say that with quotations, clearly the way that we're used to doing things, the corporate way that we're used to dealing and, and changing things cannot work for a situation like this. So when you're a company or a corporation, what can work when it comes to actually want seeing change? Yeah, the, um, the call for equity, um, uh, you know, the site that we created, uh, and if you go to linktree.com uh, backslash call for equity, um, you'll see the number of organizations as well as individuals that have signed up. I think we have now over 700 individuals and 70 organizations uh, who've made that commitment, um, you know, to start, starting the conversation and making some real actionable change. Um, so, you know, I encourage anybody who has not been on there uh, to please go there and, and read, um, you know, what, uh, what we're asking for. And I think, you know, you know, to the question, it's just, it's going to take time. It's going to take some, um, some bravery. It's going to take uh, leadership as well. Um, some of these things, quite honestly, are not going to happen unless the leaders of organizations, uh, CEOs, um, you know, chief uh, HR officers, et cetera, um, are the ones that are going to push it from top down um, because people are very comfortable in their environments, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, the way they are right now. Uh, and that, and that environment is, you know, um, you know, the water cooler talk is reflected around maybe one uh, point of conversation, you know, drinks after six, again, may, maybe just be uh, convenient for one group of people, maybe not for others. 
And quite honestly, inclusivity takes work. Um, and it is something that we're going to have to see if, um, you know, our white brothers and sisters want to put that work in. I, I can only imagine, um, you know, the amount of times that the four of us have walked into a room and yeah, we are the only, and you're like, okay, um, it's going to be an awesome night. But again, if I, if I bump into Mark, uh, that'll be great, but I probably won't because he's busy, you know, working the room in other spaces. And it's one of those things where, you know, um, we're very conscious of it. Um, you know, uh, our white brothers and sisters may not be, and that's to no fault of their own, but it's also about taking that work and just having that awareness. Uh, and I think it is something that is going to take time. It's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen after this call. It's going to happen over the long term. Uh, so we just hope that organizations and individuals put the uh, breadcrumbs in place to make it happen. And I think it's important that you say ongoing work. So I want to touch on you guys quickly before we wrap. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. You touched on it a little bit, but just if you can kind of dive in more into your initiative and what you're going to be working for in order to do your part when it comes to affecting change. Yeah, so there's a whole group of folks from NFL Canada, NHL, Google, uh, CIBC, Sobeys, all volunteers, Julian's part of it. We're trying to um, do outreach to high schools to talk about roles in marketing. We are trying to get companies to look at fully funded internships for black Canadians. And we're also trying to create mentorship because as you talked about going into a company where nobody looks like you is difficult. So that's the black talent initiative. It's all volunteer. And you know, the one comment I'd make is, is I, I think we all have to look at this as a societal issue and not a chance for us to um, yes. try to figure out how we're advancing our career or our, our company with this. This for me is very personal. Absolutely. It's literally like literally lives on yeah. the line. Um, yeah. The stakes are far too high. Nadine? Yeah, you know, many, uh, three years ago, we started a division called Brandy Q Blocks. Uh, and it, it was to look at, at, at race uh, through the lens of marketing and communication. Because what we recognized was an advertising campaign and, and marketing and communication messaging, uh, it was really um, isolationist in terms of how we talked about race. And, you know, I always say it, it, it's, it's, uh, there's no blame. It's an, an explain. You know, you know, six people mm -hmm. sitting in their cottage uh, at Muskoka who, you know, is, is signing off on a marketing campaign may not necessarily understand diversity and language and what it should look like. And so we're working through that lens to talk about in marketing communications what, what the message and language should be and to have, you know, equity in, in that area. And, and it's, it's obviously continuous ongoing work, but that's one of the things we're doing. Amazing. Thank you guys all so much. Again, ally is a verb. This is not a quick sprint to fix. Yes. This is a marathon. Yes. And I'm really hoping that mm -hmm. we see it through. So with that, Mark, Nadine, Julian, thank you so much for your time. And thank, thank you everyone you. out there um, sure. watching. Thank I'll you. pass this over back to Sean. Thank you, Kayla. Amazing. Thank, thank you, you, Kayla. And thank you, Julian, Mark, and Nadine as well for the candid discussion today. Um, I'd also like to thank Leah McNabb at the NBA. She was really helpful in setting today up. So thank you, Leah. To ensure continued change in our industry, I just ask our audience to make sure that you do review the resource list that's going to be coming out to you. Um, that's going to highlight how you as individuals can continue to make change and you know uh, lead improvement within our industry. So please do keep an eye out for that. And then lastly, just thank you everyone to, for tuning in. Um, really appreciate it and look forward to speaking to you next month. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.